blue screen with Fred Clark R on it. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, so Fred Clark R uh, After Dark is the name of the plant, but it's a new orchid genus. And so Fred Clark R After Dark is actually the first plant. And how it works is uh, it's uh, orchids are, are divided up just like plants are as well. And so um, there are palms and there's many different varieties of palms and there's pines and there's many different varieties of pines and so forth and so forth. So Fred Clark R is a combination of three genera, a Mormodes, a Catacetum, and a Cloesia. When, when you breed orchids and you combine the different genera, at some point it gets very complicated, the naming. So, you know, like we all, you know, remember Siegfried and Roy, they, they had a lion and a tiger bred together and they called it a liger. Well, if you had a liger and you crossed it with a cheetah, what would you call that? Would you call it a chiliger? You know, and then if you cross that with a puma, then what do you, you know, it, it gets impossible. And so the same thing happens with orchids. And so once you have three different genera that are combined, you can suggest a name. And so I suggested my name, Fred Clark. And so in the common, in the nomenclature of, uh, of these things, you add Ara to the end. And so it's Fred Clark, Ara. The, uh, they have perfect flowers. So interestingly, this group of orchids, Mormodes, Catacetums, and Cloesias, Catacetums have sexually dimorphic flowers. That means there are different looking flowers that are male and female. Many plants have similar flowers, the male and female sexual parts are in each blossom. But in the case of catacetums, they, are, they're, um, they have two distinctively looking flowers. The flowers are long lasting and they have very heavy substance. They have good flower size. They're large flowers and there's lots produced on an inflorescence. The plants are quite vigorous. Uh, and easy to grow for as an orchid goes. And these are the parents. And so it's a the started off with Rebecca Northern, and that was crossed with the Mormodes sinuata. And that made a hybrid called Painted Desert, Mormodia Painted Desert. And this is what Painted Desert looks like. <clears throat> I was impressed by the dark color. In the center of the lip here, you can see how dark it is in these areas. And that dark kind of black cherry color was intriguing to me. So we took painted desert and we crossed it with a catacetum with the different sex flowers called catacetum Donna Wise. Donna Wise has very dark petals and sepals, as you can see here, but a light colored lip. So the dark colored lip and the deep red color, when we cross these two together, we got Fred Clark R After Dark. Now it wasn't named yet, but that's the very first plant to bloom. And it was a surprise to me because I really wasn't expecting spots. When you look at the parents Painted Desert and Donna Wise, you're kind of expecting dark red, maybe even striped flowers. But the first After Dark appeared to be spotted. Then the next plants bloomed and they were all spotted as well. They had excellent shape with broad segments and, and flat lips. They're highly fragrant, really perfumey. The flowers are reminiscent a bit of a cymbidium flower. After about the third year of blooming, another sequence of plants started to bloom and the first one looked like this. And so you can imagine, well, my happiness when this flowered. And I, you know, I had uh, just purchased a, uh, one of those SLR, a single reflex lens, right, camera. And uh, I got down in front of this flower and I tried to take a picture of it, but the camera would not focus. It would just zoom in and out, you know, it wouldn't, it, it just wouldn't focus. And so, I was pretty sure my new camera was broken. 
So I went over to another flower, a red flower, and it zoomed right in perfectly. Took a perfect picture. I got back in front of this, got down in front of it, and the lens would just zoom in and out, in and out. And what is going on? And uh, so I realized I could probably switch it to manual focus, which I did, and then I took this picture. Afterwards, when I was uh, thinking about it, I realized that uh, this is a black flower. There is no light or not enough light being reflected off the surface of the flower into the viewfinder of the camera to see anything. That's why I had to put it on manual focus and get this picture. So there's a group of, of expert orchid judges, and they belong to an association called the American Orchid Society. And it takes years of training. It takes usually seven or eight years for an individual to become a fully accredited orchid judge. And uh, having your orchids judged is always, uh, it's always uh, a little scary, I guess, at first, because you're showing your babies to a bunch of supposed impartial experts, and they're going to pass judgment on your flowers. And so I took the one of the nicer after darks, one, one that I called Black Pearl, to the judges, and they looked at it, and they awarded it with a first-class certificate, an FCC. First class certificate is the highest honor that can be bestowed upon an orchid flower. It would be the equivalent to receiving a gold medal in the Olympics. It is top honors. In the United States, there's only 12 to 15 FCCs or gold medals issued a year. So the quality and the color and the shape and the form have to be so exceptional that it basically knocks the judges over. And so this one got an FCC, which was pretty good. This is another one that did quite well with the judges. This is Black Diamond. So it's Fred Clark Gara After Dark Black Diamond. It received a first class certificate. So when we first started exhibiting these to the judges, there was a lot of discussion about you can't really have a black flower because black is not a color of flowers, because if it was black, no insect or pollinator could see it. And so they're saying, just call it dark red, or call it dark burgundy, or call it dark purple or something. And so, of course, if you hadn't seen one, it's easy to say that. So here's taken in full sun with a white background. Looks black to me. Black is supposedly is the, so you're really not wearing black or anything in your presence is not black because true black is minus 300 some degrees Kelvin. So without that, it's, you don't really have black. It's only the per, your perception that you think it's black. So this one did good in front of the judges. Then here's Black Knight, After Dark Black Knight. It got a first class certificate. You can see the background color is gray. The stem is green and the flower is black. Here's one called Freuerbach, after dark Freuerbach. You can see the terracotta pot in the background and the black flower in the foreground. But not all of them bloomed black. And not all of them, the black ones got the highest honor. There was eight of those highest awards bestowed to Fred Clark Ara after dark. This is black cherry. There's 147 flowers on four inflorescences on this plant. Then there was a, a clonal mutation that occurred. So when I, when I had those, when you first breed a black orchid, you're not sure you can produce more. And so we took one of the best plants, black pearl, and we tissue cultured it and we produced clones or copies of the mother plant. And from that clonal process, this mutation appeared and it came out with this picotty around the margin of the petals and the lip, which is quite a beautiful looking thing. Now, you know, when you're an orchid breeder and an orchid grower, you know you've made it when as seen in Las Vegas, there is a black 
orchid slot machine named for your orchid. Now, I, of course, was not consulted on the, uh, the use of the image for this slot machine, or in fact, the naming of the slot machine. I just discovered it while I was there. And I'll tell you, you know, I suppose that could upset you in some way, but, but, I, but I, I wasn't so upset by the fact that they stealed my, stole my stuff. But those guys in Vegas, they've got no class, I tell you. If you're going to have a bunch of black orchid slot machines, shouldn't you just have about 10 of them all in a row? Now, that would be awesome. But they had a black orchid slot machines, a black orchid slot machine, and a white orchid slot machine. And a black orchid slot machine, those guys got no class. The only cool orchid is a black orchid. Unbelievable, but true. And so... Uh, this is, uh, so people have gone to great lengths, oops, gone to great lengths growing uh, Fred Clark Gara after dark. Here is uh, Andy, he's a grower back in, uh, back east in New Jersey, and he received a cultural certificate of excellence from the American Orchid Society, which is an award for master for culture, and the award goes to the exhibitor, not to the plant. And so you can see his plant, how large and robust it is, and look at all those flower spikes that are encompassing the, the, all around the perimeter of that plant. That is quite, quite an accomplishment. But you know, black orchids really get people's attention when they end up being tattoos on the back of your hand. Pretty good. And so there are other black orchids that we've made. This is Fred Clark Ara Beverly Danielson. And uh, this was awarded a gold medal by the JOGA, or the Japan Orchid Judging Association. So in Japan, they also have orchid judges. And to get a gold medal in Japan is really impressive. Uh, when you receive a gold medal in Japan, the payment that you make to the judges is $2,000. And so when you exhibit a plant that has the potential to win you also have to have the potential to pay for that honor. And so this received a gold medal. There's only one or two gold medals awarded uh, each year in Japan. And the photographer was quite crafty. You can see here on the, it's against the blue, but look against the black right here. You can almost lose sight of the flower here. The, uh, and so then there's other Fred Clark Art hybrids. So we took Marmodia Painted Desert and we crossed it with Catacetum Milana Davidson. And that produced this new cross here. And you can see we've had flowers that are as black as you would want to see, but also spotted ones. This was bred to be a smaller growing plant, uh, well suited for home growers. All right, why is it moving? Ah, so then, you know, how many black orchids do you really need? It's like how many white t-shirts do you need? Well, maybe you need one for every day of the week, right? So how many black, black t-shirts do you need? You don't need one for every day of the week, for sure. And so with orchids, black actually becomes a little boring after a while, believe it or not. And so we started bringing Fred Clark Garris for other qualities. Uh, due to the long-lasting flower life of the Fred Clark Ara genus, they make excellent plants for hobby growers. And so we started breeding for red flowers with spots. This plant received an award of merit from the American Orchid Society, which is like a silver medal in the Olympics. Then we bred the one called Dark Thereafter, and that received a first class certificate, which was quite an honor. And then we had After Hours, which also received a first class certificate. There's uh, one name for a friend of mine in Florida called Frank Smith. This one was quite impressive, not really black, but it had beautiful shape and large flower size. And then there was this one that did get a first class certificate. These flowers are about two and a half to three inches across. And the inflorescence can have 20 flowers, 25 flowers on a stem. 
oh, let's see. Then we, this is Desert Tenor, another Fred Clarkara with almost a kind of a luminescent quality about the flowers. It received a first class certificate. Then there's gemstones, which is kind of green with spotting and then midnight sky. So the a lot of variety can come out of this type of breeding. There's interlight. You can see another first class certificate. So I've done well with Fred Clark R as I think it might be the highest awarded new orchid genus ever created. I think that's probably a true statement. Interlight. And then there's Julio David Rios, just magnificent uh, glossy flowers. There's doubtless breeding for spots, uh, beautiful. And then the midnight depth, just gorgeous. Uh, the size and the shape of these next generation hybrids really exceeds the qualities of the first uh, black pearls after dark black pearls. Then they're green. We wouldn't want to leave green out of the equation. This is interlight. Uh, no doubt, no doubt this would be a good cross. And so breeding for other colors, yellows in the lips and oranges. Providence, right? Look at that pure green flower with magnificently wide segments and full lip. And then the latest breeding is a divergence away from my namesake. We discovered catamodes. If you take a catacetum crossed with the marmodes and crossed it back to another catacetum, these are the two parents. This is what the offspring look like. So it's new breeding in black orchids, but these are siblings. So brother and sister here. And, uh, amazing what can come out of the of a seed pod from an orchid plant. Dragon's Glade. Then there's other colors of Dragon's Glade. There's some that have been pure yellow. And then one, this one here, I saw at an orchid show by an exhibitor who had no idea how awesome of a black flower orchid he had. You know, this is taken and, you know, right there. And that is as black as you can have in a flower. Might even be blacker than uh, Fred Clark Gara's. Sorry. And so then what is the next breeding? So we took that same plant of Dragon's Glade and crossed it with John Burchette. And that created a Grex called Darconium. And the Darconium is just magnificent. You can see the fullness of the flower, the darkness of the color. And on the right here, you know, I have a, a friend of mine, actually lives right there, uh, right where you guys are located, a gentleman named Rick Wells. And he came over and he's been growing orchids for 30 or 40 years. And he was complaining that he had never won a first class certificate. And it's not easy to do. So I, so he was standing there and I said, well, Rick, take this plant as my gift to you. Grow it well and you will get a first class certificate on it. Now it had never bloomed before. So he grew it for two more years, flowered it, brought it to the, to the judging center and got Ebony Beauty a first class certificate. Just magnificent accomplishment. And uh, so Rick was on cloud nine as they say after that. And uh, so we just learned at the, the American Orchid Society they had their annual meeting and they vote on the best orchid of the year, the best orchid species, the best orchid hybrid and so forth. And Rick's plant, Ebony Beauty, won the best orchid of the year. And so you get a big plaque and there's an endowment for this and you, you get a nice check of a little over a thousand dollars as well. And so he's uh, a thousand bucks richer. So he's got a nice plaque and he's, uh, he's standing a little taller these days. Uh, pretty happy with his uh, growing ability. Nice to see, uh, nice to see a guy doing well, right? All right. So darconiums come in different colors though. Some have been this kind of brownish with yellows and spots. Others have been purple kind of like the one in the upper right, and then some with a combination of dark and yellow. It's hard to decide what's the most beautiful looking of these. 
And then, of course, these have names like iodine, right, and all the elements because of the name darconium. And then this one is blackonium. I thought that looked pretty impressive. That's about as matte, flat black as you're going to see. All right, so how do you grow these guys? So catacetums are a unique plant. They live where they have monsoonal environmental conditions. You want to fertilize every time you water the plant. You want to use an open, well-drained media. We find that sphagnum moss is an excellent potting media. You only divide or repot the plants with the onset of new growth. And then you don't water until the plants have new roots that are three to eight inches long. This is very specific to the cultural needs of this orchid species. And so they like conditions just like this. They like hot summers, just like most of us have here in Southern California, but they, in their winter temperatures, they don't want them to be much below, oh, maybe 55 degrees. Bright light levels in, in the case of orchids, high light and then humidity, uh, you can see there. Palm trees is a favorite environment for growing these plants. They like to grow where the leaf joins the trunk. And if you've ever studied a palm tree, you, you learn a few things about how the palm tree itself captures moisture and nutrients. The shape of the palm fronds, the way they arch up into the sky, uh, organic matter and dust and other litter fall on the leaf surface. And the way the leaf is shaped, any moisture that falls on that leaf then ducks the water down the leaf, down the stem, and it delivers it to the trunk of the palm tree. And if you've ever shucked the palm tree, you know it's a dirty job. And so, and, the, and that's good for the palm tree because it collects that dust and debris, it, co it collects uh, some, the water that falls on the leaves, it ducks it to the leaf nodes, and then it runs down to the root system of the palm tree. So the palm tree is very effective at capturing, capturing nutrients and moisture from the environment. And the catacetum intercept that moisture and nutrient stream by setting up shop where the leaf joins the trunk. Now they can grow almost anywhere in nature. This is obviously a telephone pole and you, there's a catacetum plant growing on the top of that pole. You know, the, you know what a weed is, right? We're all gardeners. A weed is a plant out of place. And I can bet you money that there's a lineman looking up there at that telephone pole, pretty sure there's a weed growing on his pole and is gonna have to climb up there and get that off of there one day. Although it's been a long time since he's done that because a plant of this size has probably been up there five or 10 years, maybe longer. But they also can grow on cactus. So what's the environment that growing on cactus? Look right, you can see right here the plant on the cactus and there's a flower spike emerging and you can see all the root system and you notice the roots are turning up into the, into the sky. And so what that is, that kind of nest of roots is a trap to capture detritus that falls down in the root system so it'll decay and then feed the plant. But you really know you got it good when you've got catacetum plants that can grow out of your house. A wayward seed must have settled in that little crack there, sprouted and growing out your house. This is how tough these are. Now I know plants don't have feelings. Well, I don't think they have feelings. But I might be a little nervous if I was spending some time in this house looking at the wiring job right here for the electrical system. That looks like a 220 circuit to me and I don't see a ground wire anywhere. All right, so the growth cycle. In nature, they live where it's hot, wet, and humid in the summer and cool and dry in the winter. Catastetums and Fred Clark Aras and the related plants need these environmental changes. The plants have evolved in the presence of these environmental changes. And orchid plants, it's been proven now that orchid plants have been living on this planet in a state that you would recognize close to 20 million years. 
So that's a, that's a long time, 20 million years. I looked up the other day how long Homo sapiens have been on this planet. That's us, Homo sapiens. That's 300,000 years. Then I, I, I already know how long orchid growers have been on the planet. That's about 120 years. And so these catacetum orchids that we're talking about have been living for a very long time on our planet and have evolved to deal with these environmental seasonal changes. Watering begins when the roots just start. Watering too early can cause bulb rot, so you don't want to do that. And so here's a plant in the early spring, and there's a new growth emerging. And so when you look at this plant as an orchid grower and you see the pseudobulbs here, the prior year, here's the prior year and here's the year before, those pseudobulbs are not dehydrated or desiccated in any way. So the plant is communicating with you. It's plant speak, right? You gotta know what your plants say. And so an orchid plant that looks like this is telling you that it has plenty of moisture stored in its pseudobulb. There isn't any green leaves on the plant. The plant is dormant, so it can't photosynthesize. So what is the purpose of water? There is none. And it doesn't rain anyway at this time of year. But there is a new growth starting, and there's plenty of moisture stored in the pseudobulb. About a month goes by and that new growth elongates. The plant is still telling you, look at my bulb. But now you see green root tips emerging at the base of the plant. This is when you get ready to water, but you do not water. After about another month, that new growth is elongated considerably. The new roots that we saw have drilled down into the potting media, and this is when you begin watering this type of orchid. The plant then enters into a rapid growing stage where you can almost measure the growth. They're very dynamic. It's not uncommon to see an inch or two of growth every week. The plant flowers and it's impressive. You, and you bring it into the meeting and you show all your friends your beautiful orchid plant and everyone ooh and ahs. Then the, the seasons begin to change and the plant prepares for dormancy. The monsoonal summer rains come to an end and the plant begins to harden itself off, drop its leaves so it can tolerate the three months of no moisture during its winter rest. So at this stage, you reduce watering, preparing the plant for that hardship. And then around, right about now, actually, actually yesterday, no, day before yesterday was the last day I watered these plants for three months. The, hopefully you have no leaves left. You can see we've bloomed this plant with one, two, three, four, five, six flower spikes. So it was quite showy through the season. And um, so here's a plant growing in the wild. It's, on, it's growing and you can see all the leaf litter sitting on the ground here. These live in a semi-deciduous forest. They have a pronounced wet summer followed by a pronounced dry winter. And so many of the same plants have evolved this same scheme. They grow the leaves in the summer, you drop them off in the fall to preserve moisture. You can see evidence of that leaf litter all around the plant. And if when you have leaf litter falling on the ground season after season for hundreds or thousands of years, you build up a rather rich organic uh, base for the plants. When you pull this plant out of the ground, you can see the new white roots that have grown, but the ground is bone dry. The rains are still several months away. You flip the plant over and you can see this root system here uh, protruding around the perimeter of the dry soil, those roots have grown in anticipation of the rainfall. And they're not growing down like tap roots. They're growing out horizontally into that rich organic litter that I mentioned earlier. So imagine this, <clears throat> the plant grows this new root system, very capable of picking up moisture and nutrients into a rich organic environment. Then the rains come and they convert that organic dry material into a solution and the roots can capitalize on that and uh, the plants can grow. So yeah, this is what you look like when you're collecting orchids. 
I think I'm, uh, I've got the crocodile Dundee down, look down pretty good, right? Now, it, you notice it looks like I'm smiling. I'm happy because I have my armful of orchid plants that I'm collected here, but actually that is not a smile. That is a grimace because you know, you may all have noticed that the unnatural way my index finger and my thumb are being held here. And you may have noticed these red spots on my shirt and the splatter on the different areas here. I cropped the photo because it was pretty gory. These catastetums live in a semi-deciduous forest. They're also cactus that enjoy living in semi-deciduous environments. And I had collected these plants and uh, and in an effort to prevent myself from falling over the side of a cliff, I thought I would grab the strongest looking uh, uh, limb I could find, and that happened to be a cactus. And uh, impaled myself, actually drove the spine all the way through my thumb. And you can't quite see it here because I had just removed it moments before, but, but uh, you know, when, uh, when you ever get a cactus thorn stuck in you, it's a one-way affair, right? Pulling it out isn't easy. So fortunately for me, it went all the way through. And so we could grab the point with my teeth and uh, pull it all the way through. And I'll tell you what is even more amazing. Wouldn't you be sure that would become seriously infected leading to amputation? <laughs> there was no infection whatsoever. You can't believe it. A cactus thorn went all the way through my thumb and there was no redness. You know, it was a little tender, but there was no infection that occurred from that. Amazing. I was in Venezuela. I was there for 14 days. This was day two of the trip. And so, yeah, amazing. All right, so here's the greenhouse in the summertime. You can see how luxurious and green the plants are. And here's the greenhouse today. The plants, that's the extreme environmental change that they go through. They, they leaf out and look gorgeous in the summer and most of the leaves fall off in the winter. Now, just because the plants don't have leaves don't, doesn't mean they won't bloom. In fact, all the plants on this shelf here are all in flower. You can see all the flowers here and including this black one. All right, so the summary is you wanna wait to irrigate. So the roots are three to eight inches long. You want to use a well-drained potting media. You're in winning active growth. You're going to fertilize and water every time. You're going to irrigate. You're going to reduce irrigation when the leaves begin to yellow. Stop when the bulbs are leafless and repot and divide just as the new growth starts. Special thanks to these guys and special thanks to you guys for being here. Now, the uh, in this whole process, I can't really put it in the talk because I'm I am. Uh, I have a contractual agreement. When the Fred Clark Ara first bloomed, there was a group of people that somehow were connected with the fact that we were getting awards and these were black orchids. And a, a, a lady reached out to me from Estee Lauder. I'm sure you've heard of Estee Lauder perfume and, uh, and beauty product company. And uh, her name was Nan Yawasa, and she introduced herself. She called me up on Friday night at 9 p.m. And uh, she said, well, I heard you have a black orchid. And I said, yeah, I've got a Fred Clark Ara after dark. The parents are Catacetum Donawise and Mormodia Painted Desert. And it's as black as can be. And she said, wow, that is really impressive. Uh, I represent Estee Lauder, and I'd like to come out and see and see the see the plant and flower. I have a client who's very interested in black orchids. I said, well, sure, you can come out and see it. She said, how about tomorrow morning at 7 a.m.? So she's calling me and it's nine o'clock at night on Friday in New York City and she wants to be at my place at 7 a.m. the next day. This means private jet is in her lifestyle. She shows up at the front door and Nanuasa introduced herself. She is the marketing director for Estee Lauder. She's about 30, maybe. Uh, and very uh, attractive lady, but not over the top. She was Chinese or Japanese American. And so I said, hi, Nanuasa. And she says, 
because I was thinking her name is like Beyonce, right? Beyonce, Nanuasa, kind of trendy at the time. And so she corrected me and she says, no, my name is Nan, last name, Uwasa. I'm like, oh my God, how embarrassing. So Nan, uh, I invited her in and we walked around the greenhouse and I showed her the, showed her the, the black orchid and she was impressed. Wow, she couldn't believe it. And then she smelled it. She didn't, we really didn't talk about the fragrance and she was blown away by the fragrance. And, you know, then she said to me, where are the parents, Catacetum Donna Wise and Mormodia Painted Desert? All right, and I looked at her. I'd only mentioned that to her once in her lifetime. It was midnight in New York City. She's a red-eyed all the way here, and she could remember the names of the parents. I know why she was the marketing director for Estee Lauder, because she had a mind that could remember things that you know, I could hardly remember myself. So I gave her an excerpt of a, a PowerPoint talk with the black orchid. I cut the flowers off the off the plant and put it in a Ziploc bag and sent it off with her. They called me Monday morning and she introduced herself. She said she's with the management, the executive management team of Estee Lauder. They have the top three perfume houses in New York City with them. And they wanted to, to talk to me about the flower. So, all right, sir, sounds good. She turns the meeting over to the, the, uh, the top dog at Estee Lauder, and, and uh, they asked me, Fred, tell us, this is one of those open-ended questions, right? Really open-ended. Tell us about the, f the fragrance of the flower. And so I said that, well, the fragrance of the flower is a sexual pheromone, period. Now, as you can tell, I can be fairly verbose. And so if I was talking to you about the fragrance, I would say that it's a sexual pheromone for a male euglossing bee. And the male euglossing bee visits the male flowers and collects the fragrances. And when it gets enough, it is attractive to female euglossing bees or some long story like that. But I decided to nip it in the bud. It's a, and I, let me t give you some advice. If the, if the uh, Estee Lauder ever wants to talk to you about fragrance, you will say and only say it is a sexual pheromone. And you could hear a pin drop in there. In fact, you could hear the muscles in the necks of the people looking at one another in the room because I had found out shortly after I said that, that one of the perfume houses guy that, that he spoke up, he was the first person to speak up and he said, Mr. Clark, we, this is an expert, right? At fragrances, a guy who makes his living uh, 400 year old companies developing fragrance says, when we smelled the flowers, we could smell the top notes of the phenols and the camphors and the cinols. But there's a whole understory of notes that we, had no, we have no idea what they are. And so apparently seconds after they had mentioned that to the meeting, I got on the phone and said, well, those understory notes are a sexual pheromone. And uh, I got, uh, shortly thereafter, I got a huge contract about, about an inch and a half pages thick, um, con wanting to make a deal with me for the rights for the fragrance and the color of the black orchid. And then there was a perfume, and there is a perfume on the market today called Tom Ford Black Orchid. And it's for sale and you can find it. And it is uh, one of the first, you know, Tom Ford, some of you might be familiar with the name. You all heard of Gucci, right? So Tom Ford was the design director at Gucci that helped make Gucci famous. He was the, the man behind the scenes. And he left Gucci to start his own business, Tom Ford Beauty. And one of the first things he did when he got out on his own was to develop this black orchid perfume. And there was, I wanted to know who the, the client was. And so I, when I was talking to Nan, I kept you know, pestering her about who the client is. Cause I was pretty sure it was like Halle Berry or something, right? Okay, I got, you know, I got, it's gotta be Halle Berry. And, I, and she was getting a little, a little annoyed with me after four or five attempts. And so finally, after we signed the contract, she told me it was Tom Ford. And I said, who? And so as soon as you, you look up 
Tom Ford, you realize that he is the he's the top dog when it comes to fashion. And if if you aren't familiar with the name, uh, you, you you will be now because when you watch the Grammys or the Emmys and the and the most beautiful gown will be a Tom Ford gown on and and uh, so anyway the perfume was a huge success you know when I made uh, and I cloned the Fred Clark R After Darks I was selling the plants for one hundred dollars each and I cloned one thousand plants and so that was a pretty good payday right you can do the math and so my efforts were rewarded. And so, and it took me about two years to sell a thousand plants. So Tom Ford and his group make a perfume. They made a hundred thousand units. This was a half ounce of perfume in a Lilique glass vial that came in a numbered case with a gold funnel. They sold a hundred thousand of them at $600 each in a month. So I learned that although I think orchids are a big deal, obviously they're not because perfume is a much bigger deal. You know, my uh, it's just unbelievable, right? The perfume industry, I tell you. So I have an original vial and the packaging and everything from the first, from the release. And uh, so my sons the other day looked it up and they said, it's now worth $3,000, dad. So that original packaging and vial and everything is now from 600 is up to, it's quite a collector's item. Amazing. So grow orchids and make orchid hybrids and you can, you can have your 15 minutes of fame with Tom Ford and his black orchid perfume. So, all right, well, I don't know. You wanna hear some more? <laughs> Let's see here. How do we get out of here? All right, did I stop sharing? Okay, screen share. Stop share, there we go. All right. So does anybody have any questions for Fred? Yay. <laughs> there are my questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Fred. That was so interesting. And uh, one of my favorite books I've ever read is called um, The Orchid Thief. Ah, uh, yeah. By Susan Orleans. Mm -hmm. I think that was that was incredible. Um, I just had a quick question though. Uh, near the beginning of your presentation, you showed um, someone's hand with a black orchid tattoo. Yeah. Whose hand was that? Whose hand was that? Yes. Uh, it's a guy, some guy back east, Philadelphia. I don't, I, I don't have to that? look up the name. I, mean, I just put that in there the other day for kicks. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I have I have a quick question, Fred. How long, when you first started doing that, how long did it take for you to produce mm. the first black orchid? Well, we weren't really, you know, setting out to breed black orchids because, you know, it's been a myth, right? Uh, and so a black orchid's been a myth for a long time and no longer. But, and so really breeding for black, I was breeding for dark, like dark burgundies and things like that. And so, and so in the process, uh, I took those two parents, the um, Rebecca Northern and crossed to Assiniwata. That took about five years. And so then I had Painted Desert and then I crossed it with a plant that I acquired from a friend of mine, Donna Wise. And then that took about another five years. So it was about 10 years in the making. And then after the first, the first ones, boom, you know, it wasn't very fertile. When you make a hybrid with orchids, sometimes you get millions of seeds and sometimes you get 28. And so I got 28 Fred Clark Ara plants from that first batch. And there was eight first class certificates that came out of 28 plants. And I sold some and my customers got first class certificates as well. And so after those plants were produced, we were anxious to remake the cross again. And uh, 
so we did, and then we also cloned it. So it really didn't become available into the marketplace probably five years after those original plants were awarded. And it's gone on to be a very significant worldwide. There have been over a hundred awards, plant quality awards given to different Fred Clark Aras uh, around the world. And I'm talking everywhere, you know, it's, uh, it's not, probably not the most awarded orchid plant. There have, there's another, another one called the, a Phragmopedium, Jason Fisher, that might have more awards. But that, that plant has been, there's been literally millions of those uh, bred and distributed where Fred Clark Aris, probably less than 5,000 total plants ever produced. Oh, wow. And I had one other quick question. I'm that uh, telephone pole or whatever it was that had the, the orchid growing up, was that in Venezuela, I guess? Yeah, yeah, that was in Venezuela. The, uh, you know, telephone poles, they're treated with creosote, right? So they don't rot. Now, you wouldn't think that creosote would be a good potting media for your plant, obviously. And so uh, clearly that uh, the guy who treated that pole wasn't very good at his job because the tip of it must have not been submerged in the creosote. But when you go to... Uh, I was in Trinidad recently, and it's just right across the, the water there from Venezuela. And I saw a bunch of catacetums also growing on telephone pole there. And most often in Trinidad, they were growing on the very top of the pole, not on the side like that image we saw, but right out of the top. So it looked like a little crown of uh, on the top of the telephone poles. And it was impressive because when I was there, they were all blooming and you could see the flower spikes and you were fighting the urge to climb up the telephone pole to get closer and take a good look. <laughs> one of my other questions that I wrote down was how, how much does a black or one of your orchids cost? I bet you had mentioned they go for about a hundred dollars. Well, they did back then when they were, they were rare. I don't have any more now, you know, as uh, that was about 12, 15, 14 years, maybe so something like that ago. And so, you saw the other Fred Clark Rs that I was showing you, the new hybrids. And, and so I'm a plant breeder. And so what I do is I make, I make crosses, make hybrids, and then I sell unbloomed progeny. And so, uh, uh, and I, so I haven't seen them flower. So many of the plants I've sold, I'm sure, are of excellent quality. And so what the orchid hobbyists do is they buy the potential based on my skill as a hybridizer, and then they flower that plant. And, and you, you know, you guys know, if you buy a hybrid plant, whatever it may be, and the first time that hybrid plant blooms, you've got to know that you are the first person in the history of the world ever to see that flower. And that's good stuff, right? That's really good stuff. I mean, you don't get to you don't get to do that very often, but you can with plants and buying hybrids. And so, so that's what I love to do. I like to love to make orchid hybrids and bloom first bloom plants and see, see those first flowers. And a lot of orchid hobbyists have the same problem I do. <laughs> they really enjoy that. Yeah, interesting. That's pretty interesting. Does anybody else have any questions for Fred? So do you, yes, Anna. Um, I'm Anna. Uh, do you, what kind of orchids do you sell now since you no longer have any more of the black? Well, I'm, uh, well, I don't have that particular black orchid. So we're always, so being an orchid breeder is like an artist and you don't want to repaint the same kind of painting over and over again. You might find some success with that, but over time you're going to get bored with it. And so that happens to me as an orchid breeder. So I'm always trying to breed and develop new things. Um, and so I have a whole bunch of Fred Clark Aras that although they've sold out this year, but we'll have some for next year. We'll have different catacetums and mormodes and cycnoches. Each year we have a brand new offering, but I also do a lot of breeding with cattleyas. And I have the lion's share of what I, the work I do is with cattleyas, but we also breed paphiopedlums and dendroviums and sarcochylus and stanhopias and zygopedlums and cymbidiums. And so we have a whole, a whole range of things that we're always working on. You can, you can look at, at the website if you like. It's, uh, it's just sunsetvalleyorchids.com. I'm only 
half hour away from you guys, 40 minutes away from you down here on the other side of Camp Pendleton in Vista. Okay. That sounds so, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, just check out the website. There's a, there's a for okay. sale X section and there's a whole huge photo section. Since a lot of my, my customers are, are like us, right? They're plant nuts. They just focus on orchids. They, you know, they like to research and learn about the parents and the breeding and the background. Mm -hmm. So you'll see that I have lots of photographs on the, on the, on the website and the photo section has, I don't know, 10,000 photos in it. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else have questions? I do. Carol, go ahead. Oh, she's muted. Um, how do we get her? Stephen, are you there? Can you unmute her? Yep, just did. Okay. Well, I, I can't unmute her. I can ask to unmute. Carol Glasheen, yeah. Can you unmute her? Yeah, she should have a, you should, Carol, you should have a little, maybe something that pops up. Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Here we go. Okay, start um, over, Carol. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, have, have, um, Fred, have you ever grown an uh, orchid? Uh, on trees empathetically in, in Southern California? I have not, but you can certainly do that. And you guys who live right along the water there in frost free, you'll be able to grow uh, quite a number of Mexican species. Uh, several in particular would be very good. Would, uh, one in particular would be called Lelia anseps. And uh, that would grow beautifully on, on your trees. You do need to water it, of course, in the summer months. Um, and fertilize it. But if you're able to do that, you could certainly naturalize uh, Lelia anseps on your trees in your yard. They do quite well on oak trees. Uh, they do want to have dappled sunlight. They really don't grow in deep shade. So if you have a tree with a, th they also do pretty good on orange trees. They grow well on that and they're often a more open canopy. Oak trees also work good. A lot of folks, what they do is they put their orchid plants in a basket, a wooden basket, and then they hang the basket off the branches of their tree. Uh, that way, if, it, if you ever have to, you have a crazy frost, I don't know, or something happens, you're able to relocate and move the plant or bring it in the house when it's in flower. Yeah, you know, when I was in Florida, I saw many of them growing on palm trees. In, yeah. Inside that brown. Yeah, if you're in South brown. Florida, yeah, if you're down in South Florida, they actually would grow catacetums on palm trees in Florida. It's quite popular. I sell a lot of catacetums and uh, Fred Clark Aras and so forth to folks down there, and that's exactly what they do. But usually it's in the Miami, kind of Tampa, you know, South, um, yeah, Fort Lauderdale, you know, places like that where, it's, where they don't really get any frost. Right. And then the other thing I was interested in is how do you actually cross pollinate? <laughs> well, you know, it, actually pollination is quite simple. The act of pollinating, you just take the pollen, the male part, and you stick it on the female part, the stigmatic surface on the female part of the flower. So the actual, it's quite simple. It, it, it does, you do have to look closely and what, where, it, where, where things go, but once you've done it once, you kind of, you figure it out. The, uh, the trick really is um, knowing what parents to combine. Uh -huh. They take a while to grow. So after you pollinate a flower, it takes roughly one year for the seed pod to develop. The seed, the orchid seed is microscopic and there is no endosperm on orchid seed. It's just an embryo. So there's no food source for orchid seed and the orchid embryo needs to fall in the presence of the specific mycorrhizal fungi, proper light, humidity and moisture. And the mycorrhizal fungi invade the embryo and the waste product from that fungus serves as the food source for the germinating embryo. Once the embryo begins to turn green, 
and have some chlorophyll, it can start to photosynthesize on its own. So in order to do that in, in nature, you need to be lucky and call, fall in the presence of mycorrhizal fungi. When you sow the seed like I'm doing, you can't count on those mycorrhizal fungi to do what you want. And so you have to sow the seed in aseptic conditions in, in sterile jars on the agar media. So you harvest, the seed takes a year, it takes one year growing in the flask on the agar, then you have to take the plants out of the flask, get the young plant started, grow them one year, then pot them up into a three inch pot size another, and then finally flower the fifth year. So if you're making an orchid hybrid, you wanna make sure you're making a good one because you have a tremendous investment in time, space, and energy waiting for those first plants to bloom. Thank you. Wow. I'm not going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I have a question for Fred. This is Betty. Fred, does that stack of paper behind you on your file cabinets cost you stress? No. <laughs> it's been there so long oh. that, uh, in fact, I've got about four more inches to go oh. before it hits the shelf, see? <laughs> oh, okay, I, yeah, you're, you're living dangerously. <laughs> yeah, that is a big pile. I don't know where to put, you know, they mail you a lot of stuff, right? Oh. And so, so you know, everybody's got some financial documents that, that you get for your stocks and bonds. So you get this every <laughs> year, every month. So that's about 20 years right there. I suppose, okay. I, should, suppose I should move it. No, no, it's fine. Should have a fire, light it on fire, and watch it burn. Yeah. Fred, it looks like the the shelf is adjustable. You could always raise the shelf. Yeah, I probably well, I could probably clean off the shelf right above it there, see, oh, and, and keep it that. going all the way up to the ceiling. Now, you know, orchid growers, right, and us plant people, you can't deny we're not collectors, right? Oh, yeah. You can't deny that. If you deny it, you're just denying yourself the reality of it all. And so all those magazines and books that you see up there, that is yeah. about 60 years of American Orchid Society journals. Uh, it's from, I have the very first issue to the current issue that came out last month. That is, that is a, I don't know, you know, you just got to have those things, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Fred. I mean, if we could give you a standing ovation, I am sure everybody would want to do that. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Too bad I couldn't come up and be with you. I always enjoy coming up there and talking to your group. Yeah, well, thank you. We have um, a short business meeting to um, go into next. So if you want to stay, you're certainly welcome. If you, I'm sure you have more important things to do, but thank you again so very, very much. It was quite enjoyable. All right. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Well, um, a couple of quick announcements. Um, we are going to continue with our Zoom meetings just like we normally would on the very, on the first Wednesday of every month at one o'clock. Um, our February 3rd Zoom meeting will be a propagation workshop because mm -hmm. you, there'll be details in our next newsletter, but um, we need to start making plans for the next, the next garden fest or the, garden, the plant sale. Um, Anna, are you there? Or is, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the propagation and the gathering and the plans for the upcoming plant sale. Uh, yes. So here's what we've discussed at the board meeting and based on our current situation, as you all are aware, uh, we've decided to do a plant sale in June. And June 12th is our projected date at this time. And we're planning to do a propagation on March 11th at Teresa Whitney Home. And so that's our plan for now. Of course, uh, just so you're aware, that's our plan for today. Of course, things can change, but for now, that's what our goal will be. Uh, we're going to be having a propagation class coming up in February, uh, virtual. So it can kind of prepare you that you don't need to come to March 11th's propagation if you can't. 
but you'll be able to do it from your home. So you have the option, of course, to come and see us. We will be um, social distancing. Uh, you have to let us know in advance if you will be attending. So we have the proper numbers and of course we have to take precautions with everybody as well. But more information will be on the bulletin, uh, our normal newsletter bulletin that we'll be putting out. Um, any questions, uh, you can email me or email Teresa. And that's it for now. So we'll keep you posted. Thanks, Anna. Um, Thank also, you. everyone add June 26th to your calendar. That is the projected date for the um, 2021 garden tour. Did you want to add anything about the garden tour weeds? Um, well, the garden tour that we have planned on June 26th is uh, a bit later in the season than we have been doing them, maybe, maybe about a month later. Um, but we wanted to push it out as far as we could to um, hopefully be through with um, some of this coronavirus stuff. Um, so we'll, we'll see, you know, we're certainly hopeful that, um, that we can pull it off this year. Um, so please put that on your calendar, June 26th for the garden tour. Thanks, Weech. And civic beautification, Q, can you fill us in on what's happening and your date changes? Nope, you have to unmute, Q. Okay. You know, how, I don't know how to unmute. Oh, there you go. Go ahead, jump in. Okay, so we met today at the Park Sample 5 and there was like six of us working. So there was a lot, um, we did a lot of stuff. We filled up like four trash bags of uh, um, all the cuttings and stuff like that. So in two weeks, we will meet at the Casa on Wednesday, January 20th, but for next month, um, we'll meet uh, on February 3rd. That will be like the first Wednesday. We decide that we can still meet in the morning at nine o'clock for the Park Sample 5 on February the 3rd. And then we, will, we still can attend the general meeting at one o'clock. But for February 3rd, Gwen said that he will have lots of plans for us to plant at the at the circle, the garden, because right now there are not a lot of plants there. So he, he got some plants from the shore garden. So if you can come and help us plant things because it's pretty spare right now. We had the plants there die like we had the, what is that? The Cleveland sage, we used to have a big Cleveland sage there, but it died, so we took them out. So that garden circle is pretty, uh, Spar, so we uh, we need to plan more stuff, but uh, but that's for February third, and then he has more stuff planned for the garden because we hopefully we we can have the Memorial Day celebration there that the Park Simplified usually give out. Um, so if you can come and help with the to beautify the the garden, that would be great. So yeah, and it's usually, you can stay as long as you want, right? Um, yeah. or an hour, an hour and a half, half hour, whatever works. Yeah, yeah. There were six of us today, and we did a lot. And uh, Carol was great. She came early at eight o'clock, and um, we stay. And then more people came at nine o'clock. So even for an hour, you can get a lot done. So that would be uh, on Wednesday. We decided to do on the first Wednesday is Park Simplify. And on the third Wednesday would be at the Casa Romantica. And the Casa, uh, Lana said, they really appreciate um, us been coming there, helping also. We did a lot of uh, work there at the Casa. We put lots and lots of weeds and cut in and, and the garden looked wonderful there also. So if you can come and, and uh, join us, just an hour is, is plenty and uh, enjoying the, the view and all the beautiful plants that, that we have there. Thank you. Thanks, Q. Anybody else have any news information? So I guess... Hey, Carol, I'm sorry. Um, Carol, I, I wanted to add um, something else to everyone's calendar. Um, 
Q and I are going to be hosting our next beach cleanup on Monday, January 25th at 9.30 a.m. And um, we'll be at the North Beach location. So um, January 25th at 9.30, we'll, we'll send out a reminder, but if you can put that on your calendar, it's, um, that's always lots of fun. And uh, we feel good about being out in the fresh air and helping out the environment while we're at it. Good. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Beach. Okay. Oh, Cindy, you're muted still. No, nope, you're still muted. There you go. Got it. Is Sarah Gould there? Hi. Yeah. All right, thanks. She's oh. going to talk to you about junior gardeners. Um, so I've met with um, one, two, three, four, five. I've been to five of the different schools and we can't go on the campuses. We can only go on Saturdays or Sundays. Um, so they still want our help. Um, it's just hard, kind of hard to schedule it because the schools are like, ah, sometimes our gardeners are going to be there, their guys cutting the grass or sometimes the playground people. So it's just, it's been really tricky to figure out when we can go. Um, but uh, most of the schools are still having their garden. Um, we've, San Clemente High School is gonna join and get, you know, um, they're gonna try to get the, the grant. And uh, the Truman Middle School or Elementary School, they're just looking for someone that can volunteer to help with their garden. So I don't know if anybody lives near any of the schools, but that would probably be the best way is if it's just the school by you, you know, contact me and I can tell you how to go and work at the school on the weekends, but that's all we can do right now. Fair enough. <laughs> okay, thank you, Sarah. Yep. And Laura Bard is here for any horticultural questions. Where is Laura? Is Laura here? I don't see her. Let's see. Yeah, I, Cindy, I didn't recognize her. Um, I didn't see her name or her face during oh, the meeting. You must have gotten busy. She must have, I'm looking on the list. I don't see her. Yeah. No, One no. of my questions was, I'm looking for a new gardener who will be anticipate things in my yard. So if anyone has a fabulous gardener, I would really like their contact information. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? On that same note, I'm looking for a new gardener myself. <laughs> so send me some information if you have a good one. Thank you. All right, if there's nothing else, thank you for attending today and look forward to February 3rd where we will have a workshop for propagation. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you.